Now that's what I'm talking about. That's what I'm talking about, friends. Uh, good to be together. Thank you so much for coming. You are uh, overwhelming us almost, and we are delighted. Uh, when these Gregories travel, they carry quite an entourage with them. And so welcome to all, but especially those who are guests among us today, uh, too numerous to mention, but all very, very uh, sincerely welcome. My name is Dan King. I'm the uh, temporary interim uh, pastor here for the last 14 months at uh, South Lake, and uh, we hope that all of you who are visiting with us today will be made entirely welcome and will feel to the fullest measure possible uh, right at home. We want you to worship freely. Um, this is an extraordinary day for us in having the Gregories here to visit, uh, but also extraordinary in that we have a guest musician today. Our normal uh, musician is away, and uh, so it's, it's new, 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 new all around. Uh, Joel Jessen is here with his daughter Abigail. Joel is an elder at the First Presbyterian Church in Stanley and uh, fills in for us from time to time when our music director, Mike Wallace, uh, has to be uh, elsewhere. So welcome to them, uh, welcome to you all. For those uh, South Lake regulars, remember Sunday School, still on Zoom, five o'clock this afternoon, but remember that uh, red letter date, June the 6th, is when we're going to resume, Lord willing, a face-to-face -face Sunday School here in the church building uh, once again. Today is the uh, monthly celebration of the Lord's Supper, and as part of that, we always have an opportunity for a special gift to our deacons fund for the needs of the needy in our congregation, but also in our community, and you'll have an opportunity, a second opportunity, to make a gift uh, during or immediately after the observance of the Lord's Supper uh, today. Jed Belvin, one of our ruling elders, is going to come and introduce our guest speaker for the day. Good morning. Wow, what a what a crowd. It's a great day to be here and uh, be able to all worship together, of course. And um, as Dan said, and 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 I think we all know the the uh, Gregories have brought quite a crowd here. So we we uh, first of all just wanted to welcome uh, Chris and his family. Just a quick word of of. Um, introduction to Chris, uh, so you guys know uh, where he comes uh, from. Um, he comes to us uh, from Stonebridge uh, Community Church currently uh, here in Charlotte. Y'all, Many of y'all know that Stonebridge is uh, one of our largest uh, churches uh, here in our presbytery. Um, he was uh, ordained uh, recently uh, at RTS uh, here in Charlotte and graduated uh, previously from Appalachian State. Uh, I won't hold that against you. I went to Furman University, um, big rivals back in our day, but uh, good news. Um, he's had uh, his, throughout his uh, professional uh, ministerial career, he's um, been at uh, Duthan, Alabama uh, with a First Presbyterian Church there. He was part of uh, Covenant uh, Presbyterian Church in Chattanooga, Tennessee. And then uh, Stonebridge had you back, so that's a good sign, right? Um, but most of all, just really want to welcome you here. Had a chance to meet, let's see, your, your wife's over here, and uh, Reba, uh, right? <laughs> so uh, had a chance to meet uh, Chris's wife, Reba, who, um, like I often said, has told me his, you're his best asset. So we, we thank, you for, thank you for being here with us as well. Um, Chris and uh, Reba have been married for uh, 19 years and have uh, six, uh, no, sorry, seven uh, beautiful children, so good there. Um, anyway, we just hope that uh, all of y'all will take an opportunity um, after the service to meet Chris, meet his family, introduce yourselves to him, and then as, um, as you get the opportunity, uh, our sessions had a chance to spend some time with Chris and 
Um, we just thank you for being willing to come and, and uh, share the word with us today. And also, Joel, thank you. We appreciate your time here and being able to fill in for Mike so quick. Thanks a lot. God's word calls his people to worship, hear the call. You who bring good tidings to Zion, go up on a high mountain. You who bring good tidings to Jerusalem, lift up your voice with a shout. Lift it up. Do not be afraid. Say to the towns of Judah, here is your God. He tends his flock like a shepherd. He gathers the lambs in his arms and carries them close to his heart. He gently leads those who have young. This is the God whom we come to worship today. Please join me in prayer. Oh Lord, you have loved us with an everlasting love. Although you rule over us full of majesty and power and might, you also relate to us as a tender shepherd, and we're grateful for that. You've sent your son to pay a immeasurable price, a high price to rescue wandering sheep like us. And so as we gather to worship in the name of that great shepherd, we pray that you'd send your spirit to enable that worship, that we might rightly exalt our triune God. For the sake of Christ and the glory of his kingdom, in his name we pray. Amen. Joel, come and please lead us in worship. Well, good morning, South Lake. Uh, greetings from First Pres and Stanley. It's good to be here with you and to, and to worship with all of you. Please uh, join me, stand up, and uh, we'll start off with uh, Blessed Be Your Name. Blessed be your name in a land that is plentiful, where your streams of abundance flow. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name when I'm found in the desert place. Though I walk through the wilderness, blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. Blessed be your name when the sun shining down on me. When the world's all as it should be, blessed be your name. Blessed be your name on the road marked with suffering. Though there's pain in the offering, blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. You give and take away. You give and take away. My heart will choose to say, Lord, blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. 
Blessed be your name, Jesus. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. Our first reading from God's Word this morning comes from the Gospel of Matthew, just two verses, 35 and 36 from the ninth chapter, Matthew chapter 9, verses 35 and 36. This is the Word of the Lord. Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them, because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. The grass withers, the flowers fall, but this, the word of our God, stands forever. Let's pray together this prayer of confession. Please pray with me as I lead us. Gentle shepherd, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. We have sinned against you in every conceivable way. Our creativity in this matter seems to be without limit. And so we have offended. And we are guilty because we have known better. We are your people those whom you have instructed by your word, those whom you have given a model, a perfect example in the living word, those in whose hearts you have caused your Holy Spirit to lodge. And so we are not ignorant. We cannot plead that we did not know. And therefore our sin is multiplied and all the more heinous. We need a great Savior And so we thank you and bless you that in Jesus Christ we have the forgiveness of sins, that we have a righteous one who has made a full, perfect, and sufficient sacrifice for the sins of his people. And all those who look to him can be saved. And so while we confess and readily acknowledge our extreme need, we confess and joyfully acknowledge his absolute sufficiency and our hearts are lifted and our resignation grows and our love for you increases and our desire to honor and please you who have done so much for us in Christ flourishes. So Lord, help us. Leave those things behind which should be left behind. If you put them behind your back, may we do the same, but let us press on to the glorious hope of renewal of holiness and righteousness, beauty and strength, as Christ continues to minister to us and fill us. In his name we pray. Amen. Please stand and sing in Christ alone with me. In Christ alone my hope is found He is my light, my strength, my song This cornerstone, this solid ground Firm through the fiercest drought and storm What heights of love, what depths of peace when fears are still, when striving cease, my comforter, my all in all, 
Here in the love of Christ I stand. In Christ alone who took on flesh, fullness of God in helpless babe, this gift of love and righteousness, scorned by the ones he came to save, till on that cross where Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied, for every sin on him was laid, here in the death of Christ I live. There in the ground his body lay, light of the world by darkness slain. Then bursting forth in glorious day, up from the grave he rose again. And as he stands in victory, Sin's curse has lost its grip on me, for I am his and he is mine, bought with the precious blood of Christ. No guilt in life, no fear in death, this is the power of Christ in me. From life's first cry to final breath, Jesus commands my destiny. No power of hell, no schemes of man can ever pluck me from his hand. Returns or calls me home. Here in the power of Christ I'll stand. Please be seated. I wanted to um, give a special word of welcome to uh, Pastor Rick Harper, his wife Anne, their four children a former pastor at Stonebridge Church, but now missionaries with Surge on their way to Austria. And within the month, they'll be leaving to go overseas and to serve the Lord there as a pastor to missionaries in Europe. And so Rick and Ann, girls, it's a great pleasure to be worshiping with you. I want to have a special prayer of blessing on you and your uh, endeavors upcoming. And I'll combine that with our prayer of dedication for the offering, if I may. Those of you who are guests today, please feel no pressure uh, to make a, a monetary gift. This is just one of the ways that we worship. Uh, you may contribute, but under no obligation. So let us pray. Father in heaven, we give you thanks for choice servants whom you call and you equip and you send and uh, whom you uh, provide with support networks. And so we know that in this congregation of gatherers worshiping here today that you have many supporters of Rick and Ann Harper, the girls, and their work uh, with Surge. We thank you for this opportunity. We thank you for the unique combination of life experience, of training and education, of godliness that they bring, and the excitement that uh, Surge obviously has in their addition to their ministry teams. And so we pray that you'd send them out with confidence, confidence in their own hearts, that they are in the center of your will, that you continue to supply their needs, that you'd fill them with thankfulness and eager expectation over the prospects for fruitful ministry. Many years, we pray, in that place and that you would bring their gifts to the, to the peak, that when they arrive, they might be able to engage and immediately to provide help for those who need pastoral guidance, counsel, and uh, support. Lord, you support us in so many different ways in terms of pastors and teachers, uh, spiritual guides whom you give us, but you also meet our daily needs for bread 
and for all that sustains us. And so out of that abundance, we give a portion to you now, praying that it might be used for great effect in your kingdom, to the honor of Christ, in whose name we ask it. Amen. If I can move that over here. All right, does that work? Okay. Again, it's uh, great to be with you guys this morning to be able to worship. Uh, see so many people here. I had no idea. We were honored to have Rick Harper here. Good to see you. <laughs> um, thanks for being with us this morning. And i uh, like to hear more, I get a chance to talk to you before you leave, and looking forward to that. Um, but what a beautiful day. Um, it's been wonderful weather here lately, and just a reminder of, of how the Lord, as, uh, when he returns, will make all things new again. I love, love this time of year. If you would, uh, let's bow our heads and pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, how good it is to be in your house today. For you alone are worthy to be praised. You alone are worthy of all honor and glory. For you are the creator of all things, and we are your people. May our worship today be pleasing in your sight and restore our souls so that we can serve you and complete the task that you have prepared for us to do. In your infinite wisdom and love for us, you sent your Son into this world, not to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. For he is the good shepherd, and the good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. Open our hearts to hear your voice. Father, I lift up our congregation here at South Lake to you. I thank you for your continued protection on our people. May you help us to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have called us, with humility and gentleness and patience, bearing with one another in love. You have blessed each of us with unique gifts. Help us to use these gifts to serve one another and to further your kingdom. Father, I pray that you would give our elders and deacons wisdom and discernment to be in tune with your perfect plan. I lift up South Lake Christian Academy to you as they wrap up the final weeks of this school year. I'm thankful that in such a difficult year, our teachers and administration 
was willing and able to teach the students in person throughout this year. And I'm thankful that the students were able to hear the gospel preached during chapels this year. I pray your blessings and continued protection on them this summer. Father, we have many friends and family that are sick or hurting and need your healing hand. You know the needs of your people before they're even on our lips. We continue to lift up Connie Pearson to you and pray that you would take away her knee and back pain. We ask that you would give her doctor's wisdom. We lift up Judy Boozer to you. We are thankful that she is doing well and pray for continued good health. We continue to lift up John and Ginger Wilkie to you as John is seemingly preparing to come home to you. We pray for comfort and a peace that surpasses all understanding. And Father, I lift up our local and foreign missionaries to you. We especially lift up Robbie and Lydia Sweet right now as they serve in Scotland. We pray for the Sweets and their children as they transition from St. Andrews to Glasgow. While it will be difficult for them to leave friends, we pray for your blessings on their ministry, that the gospel will continue to be spread and that it would bear much fruit. And Father, we continue to lift up our nation to you. I pray for our president and elected officials that they would seek your will for this country and not the selfish desires of their own hearts. I pray that you would thwart those that would seek to do us harm. We pray for your hand of protection on our military, as well as the police officers and first responders that protect and serve our community every day. Again, we thank you for the uh, opportunity to give tithes and offerings that we just gave and we were as we return a small portion of what you graciously provided to us may it be used to further your kingdom and now i lift up chris gregory to you we are thankful that he is here with us today to share your word give him the words that you would have us to hear may his message penetrate our hearts and point us to a closer relationship with you Thank you for the most precious gift of your son, Jesus Christ. For it is in his name that I pray. Amen. Chris, turn it over to you. Thank you for being here. Thank you, brother. Thank you. It is good to be in the house of the Lord today. Uh, it's good to see you all and uh, some familiar faces back there. Um, Welcome. Glad you're here. Uh, this morning, if you would, if you have your Bibles, you can turn with us to Psalm 23. Um, thank you, Sam. <laughs> I needed that. Uh, this is what I look like. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry. This is all I've got. Uh, but we're going to be this morning examining Psalm 23. Uh, it's very similar to John 3.16, the, the best passage of the best known passage of the Old Testament. Um, and so for years, millennia even, uh, this psalm has been presented at weddings, it's been presented at funerals. Certainly when I uh, did my chaplaincy down at Presbyterian, uh, down in downtown Charlotte when I was in seminary, it was not uncommon in the face of tragedy for us to turn to Psalm 23. It seems to be something that's right for all occasions. And I would suggest to you that as we're looking at it, this psalm speaks of green pastures. This psalm speaks of still waters. But for believers, for millennia, this psalm has been a source of a green pasture in the midst of life's turmoils, in the midst of life's celebrations. It takes us back. It takes us to a green pasture, as we'll see, to still waters, to the great shepherd of our soul. And I think it's good when we talk about Scripture to remember this is good poetry. This is better than Shakespeare. And you're going to see rich theological truths unpacked in about five words sometimes. It's amazing. Uh, Scripture is one of the only books I can think of that every time you go back, there's, it's like tweaking a diamond. You see something different every time it's presented. Having said that, uh, in the midst of this, 
we're going to see that great shepherd of our souls, even Jesus Christ, who said, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened. I will give you rest. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for this time, the gift of your word. You are the speaking God. You don't play hide and seek with us. You don't uh, take any great joy or delight uh, in hiding yourself from us, but instead you reveal yourself to us. You speak clearly and plainly to us. And Father, we thank you that we are so dependent on you. We are but sheep You are the great shepherd. And so, Father, I pray the words of my mouth, the meditations of our heart would be edifying to this precious bride, the bride of Christ, who he suffered for and gave his life as a ransom. We pray this in the name of Christ. Amen. Uh, This morning we're going to be looking at three aspects. And again, you could mine this passage for weeks of sermons, and I I promise not to do that. It may perhaps feel like I've been talking for a week, but uh, we're going to look at three aspects this morning. The sheep, the shepherd, and shalom. Uh, That is peace, specifically the peace of God. The sheep. Now, I want to tell you... uh, I know nothing about sheep. Uh, I am not Farmer Chris. Uh, I've never met a shepherd. Does anybody in here raise sheep or any shepherds in here? Thank you. Good. Uh, Me either. And yet, what we see in Scripture, what animal are humans the most often referred to as being, compared to as? Well, sheep. So I wanted to take a minute just to unpack what exactly it means when Scripture refers to every person who's ever been born as being some sort of a sheep. Um, What are they like? Well, first of all, uh, the American hymn, Come Thou Fount, uh, says this about you and I. We are prone to what? Prone to wander. Lord, I feel it, and it's ironic. Prone to leave the God I love. Lord, I love you. I'm prone to wander from you. Boy, can you relate to that? There's a picture of a sheep prone to wander. Their nature is to be difficult. Do you have any difficult people in your life? Um, I'm sorry, honey. Uh, Sometimes it's me. Uh, Boy, the adjectives keep coming. Foolish. Uh, There's this wonderful video somebody sent me uh, last week, actually, uh, there's a sheep that's stuck in a, a crack here in the ground, and you see the shepherd, and he's working hard and barely hanging on by a root, and he's, he's able to reach down to the sheep and lift him up, and uh, it's a lamb. So as soon as he sets the sheep down, the lamb bounds off, and he's jumping and running and confident and falls right back into the hole, uh, prone to wander, stubborn, foolish. And yet Isaiah 53, uh, there on the front of your bulletin says, All we, that is every person born post-fall, sons of Adam, daughters of Eve, all we are like sheep. We go astray. We are prone to wander. Now, just as a sheep, that's in their nature. That's who they are created to be. Fallen man, that is in our nature nature. Uh, We are acting according to our nature when we do these things. It's a sin problem. And so, uh, essentially what we see in Scripture then is if all are like sheep, who's the shepherd? Well, I would suggest to you that we're presented with this picture of two kinds of sheep. There are sheep who have no shepherd. There are sheep who have said, I'm going to shepherd myself, thank you very much. I'm going to live according to my internal compass, uh, which is always changing and uh, hardly ever accurate, if ever. And there are sheep who have said, I need a shepherd. And I have found it. Yes, I'm a sheep, but I'm being cared for. I'm being provided for. I'm being protected by the Lord Jesus Christ. All are sheep. Some have found the shepherd in Christ. Others are like sheep without a shepherd. And is that not what Jesus said? He looked at these people. And what's it like not to have a shepherd? They're harassed. They're tossed back and forth. And it grieves Jesus because they have no shepherd. And so Jesus in John 10, by the way, Christ was familiar with all the Psalms, particularly this one. He says in John 10, 
I am the good shepherd. By the way, the Hebrew word for I am is Yahweh. Yahweh. Jesus has these great, in Greek it's ego a me, but in, in the Hebrew it's Yahweh. And so when Jesus says, I am the vine, I am the way, the truth, and the life, I am the good shepherd, what he's saying, the Hebrew word for that is Yahweh. He's hinting at, I'm the Lord. I'm the one. So in the Old Testament we speak of the good shepherd, and in, G in the New Testament Jesus says, it's me. It's all pointing to me. I am the good shepherd. And what do I do? I lay down my life for the sheep. And so for those of you who know Jesus Christ as your Lord, your Savior, and your King, who have acknowledged your own sinfulness, who have not acknowledged with a psalm that says, nothing in my hands I bring, simply what? To thy cross I cling. If that's you, this psalm should give you great comfort, great encouragement. And if that's not you, I want to encourage you with everything I have in me, run to Jesus. He is the shepherd. This shepherd gladly receives sinners. That's the Jesus we're presented with in Scripture. A Jesus who welcomes sinners. Like me, like you. So if that's the sheep, we're going to look next at the shepherd. What is the shepherd like? David begins, and uh, he would have known something about shepherding, right? Uh, certainly as uh, they were looking for him. Uh, is this all your sons? And what was said? Well, there is that one guy that I forgot. And what was David off doing? He was out shepherding the sheep. Uh, he was the youngest. So David begins as a shepherd king by saying, you know, the Lord is my shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. Now, very quickly, uh, if you remember at the beginning, we said Hebrew poetry packs a lot of theological punch into as few words as possible. So, um, I enjoy uh, audience participation, and I don't want to make you feel awkward, but what are some things that a shepherd does? You can yell it out. There's no wrong answer. Well, there's maybe some wrong answers, uh, but what are some things that a shepherd does? What was that? They lead. They lead the sheep. The sheep follow the shepherd. What else does a shepherd do? They protect them. That's exactly right. A good shepherd is ready to defend against robbers, snakes, lions, bears. And we're going to see some more of that in a second. What else does a shepherd do? Care. Care. A, sh a good shepherd cares about how the sheep are doing. You can tell the quality of a shepherd by how well the sheep are doing. Their fur all matted? Is their, sure, is their fur nasty? Is it gross? Uh, I don't want my sheep to be a part of that guy's fold. David said, the Lord is my shepherd. Let me brag on him for a second. Let me show you what he does. I would, uh, to go along with that, he's with the sheep. He's present with the sheep. He knows what's best for the sheep. He knows them by name. He knows how many sheep he has and which ones aren't his. He doesn't leave the sheep. He lives his life with the sheep all the time. At night, he sleeps beside the sheep. He protects them, as has already been mentioned, and he feeds them. Now, why am I saying all this? Because Hebrew poetry, all David said is, the Lord's my shepherd. And we make the connection between, well, look at all that that means. Do you see how rich the imagery is here? I mean, you're putting yourself there through the eyes of a shepherd and going, he leads me, he protects me, he feeds me, he cares for me, he clothes me. He... This is what David's communicating. Five words. All of that's implied in that. And more. And more. So who is the Lord? I am the shepherd. I'm bragging about my God. His banner, as Solomon says over it, his banner over me is love. He's adopted me. The other fold that I was in was in sin and death and bound for hell. And he grabbed me with the crook and he brought me in. Romans 8, Paul says, you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear. You have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father, the Lord takes us and he adopts us into his fold. Are we the best investment all the time? Of course not. He welcomes us, sinful though we are. A quick note, uh, kings and queens, uh, certainly in the ancient Near East, were always called to shepherd. It was never this tyrannical rule where you lord it over the people. It was you rule, but you also 
care for them. So when David says, the Lord is my shepherd, one of the titles for uh, Yahweh is the king of kings. David is saying also here, he's the king's king. That denotes for a believer questions like, well, what do you think about this? What's your opinion of this? Well, that's important, but it's secondary to what does my king think about this? I am to take all of my thoughts, all of my life, all of my will as a believer and submit it to the kingship of Jesus Christ. How do I know what he wants? He reveals it in his word. God doesn't play hide and seek with us. He's the king, I'm not. If God and I are on a separate page, I'm on the wrong page. My call is to get on God's page. He's the shepherd king. Moving along, David goes on to say, I shall not want. Uh, perhaps uh, some of you have a translation that says, I lack nothing. I would ask you, uh, does anybody in here want things, though? Are there not times uh, that we look? I uh, certainly want my daughters to marry godly men who will cherish them, but uh, more than that, cherish the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, I want lunch at some point today. Um, is that wrong? Well, I, I would suggest to you uh, that certainly we read in the Philippians 4, Paul tells us, make your petitions, that is our requests, known to God. And so David is not saying somehow uh, you're sinful if you want something. Uh, that's not necessarily, now by the way, it can be, uh, but at the same time, what David has in view here is God's providential hand. And what I mean by that is God is going to provide us, number one, with whatever it is that's going to bring him the most glory. And we're going to see in a few minutes that, that God is obsessed with his name's sake. Why? Because there's only one name under heaven and earth that men by which men can be saved. So God's name is to be lifted up because it's only God's name that saves mankind. But second of all, God's always working for our good, for the good of his saints. Now, does that mean that we'll always get exactly what it is that we want? No, we are sheep. One of the things about being a sheep is I'm confused about what I need. We are confused as a people about what we truly need. Why? Because we're sheep. It's hard for us to know, but praise God. God, as the good shepherd, looks and says, Chris... I know what you need better than you know yourself. So I can look and say, well, I think I need this. But if God has held his hand back, if God has said no, and by the way, does God say no? Absolutely God says no. If I have, uh, you know, I have six daughters, and uh, if our youngest... Uh, uh, holds up a bottle of Mr. Clean that has a, a cartoon friendly looking bald guy on there and says, I want to drink this, Dad. And I say, No, of course not. She may look at me and go, But I want it, Dad. Why are you being so mean to me? Why are you withholding this good thing from me? Am I going to bow in and say, You're right, you're right. I don't want you to be upset, honey. Go ahead. Of course not. I want to be a good father. I would suggest to you that there are things, all of us as sheep, go, Father, but I need this. How could you withhold this good gift from me? And it's exactly like this, because the thing so often that we want will kill us. And God says, I'm a good shepherd. I'm not going to give you that. Uh, I know you want it. No. But by the way, just as often, James tells us every good and perfect gift flows down to us from the heavenly Father of lights. So there are many good gifts. God's heart, according to Jeremiah, is to bless and not to curse. Paul David goes on to describe uh, the life of a sheep, uh, living in Christ's fold. Uh, and he's got these four wonderful images. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with J.I. Packer. Uh, he was a former vet. He went home to be with the Lord last year. But he described uh, two things that I didn't know. Uh, in verse 2, David said, He makes me as a sheep lie down in green pastures. Sheep will not eat dried, shriveled grass. 
Uh, they ate only the green, the fresh grass. So what does God provide? Not just any old thing, but the best for his sheep. He looks and he says, I'm not just going to let you get by. My heart is to bless you. I, I make you lie down in the green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. Sheep, I don't know if you knew this. I, again, as I've researched this, uh, I'm learning a lot about sheep. Um, J.I. Packard says that what they do is if a shepherd is, is herding the sheep and they come to water that is moving quickly, the sheep won't drink. Even if, it, even if they're exhausted and their tongues are hanging out of their mouth and they've been driven hard, they will not drink from moving water that's swiftly moving water. Don't know why. Maybe it gets up their nose. We don't know exactly what it is. But what you do see here is God cares about not just our souls. He does care about our souls, as we'll see. But he cares about our physical needs. If you need money, you can pray about it. It's okay. It's not somehow unspiritual to pray about your physical needs. Uh, about between 5.30 and 6, every morning I have arthritis in my back. It wakes me up. I pray about that. That's not somehow uh, ungodly to pray about. If you need a car, pray about Ask the Father to provide a car. He cares about every inch of you, every inch of his sheep. And yet, by the way, his eye is on the sparrow. He cares, he provides rain for trees that don't even give him praise. How much more is he going to provide for his people? And yet, uh, he does care about these inner needs. Verse 3, he restores my soul. Uh, each of us is made of two parts, right? Our body and our soul. And it's always appropriate to ask, how's your soul, brothers? How's your soul? Uh, how's your ongoing battle against your sinful flesh going? Uh, is it not fatiguing at times? Uh, I don't know about you. Uh, certainly these last few weeks, I've been exhausted. Uh, and, and a deep sense that no nap, uh, eight hours of sleep uh, doesn't cure. I have just been spiritually exhausted. Well, uh, when I was a boy, um, glow-in-the-dark things became very popular for a while. Every time you look, there were glow-in-the-dark. You know, it would not karate chop action, but it'll glow-in-the-dark, these toys. And the way they worked uh, was eventually they would lose their charge. And so what did you do when something that was made of this material, like for example, perhaps a ring, lost its charge, how did you get it to glow in the dark again? You held it up to a light. So imagine this ring is a, a glow-in-the-dark ring. Uh, it would last for a while, but you know what? Eventually I would have to hold it against a light, and then it would start to work correctly again. When we read about God's Word, He revives my soul. How does He do that? Well, uh, I would suggest to you, uh, I would encourage you rather, to turn to Psalm 19.7. The law of the Lord is perfect, and what does it do? Re yes, restores or revives the soul. Re means again, vive comes from vivify or vivid colors, it means alive. The law of the Lord is perfect, first of all, the fact that we can turn to anything in this fallen world and say, that's perfect. Uh, I was at a wedding yesterday, uh, and it was beautiful. They were uh, completely in love, and I'll just tell you this story real quick. Uh, we were doing the premarital counseling, and uh, Drew would say these things, and, I, and, and they were good, and, and his uh, fiance would look at me and then look at him and just go, he is so wise. And I went, oh, that's okay, brother, that's great. Um, hold on to that. Uh, don't forget that moment. Uh, but it was this beautiful wedding, uh, and they were completely in love, loved Jesus, shared the gospel, um, wonderful wedding. But you look in the midst of moral confusion, you look at the midst of a generation that says wrong is right, up is down, there is no good, there is no evil. And yet we're standing there looking at a marriage and going, this is good. No one needs to be confused about what's happening right now. This is good. David says, the law of the Lord, perfect. And what does it do? It brings you back to life. It's taking the glow-in-the-dark ring and putting it back up to the source. How often do I need it? How often do you want to glow? How often do you want to reflect the glory of God? When Moses would go up to meet with the Lord, he would come down, and what would happen? His face would glow. Uh, so much so that he had to hide it. 
He leads me in paths of righteousness for my, for my glory, to build my kingdom, to build my reputation, to have friends and influence people for his name's sake. He leads me in paths of righteousness. Now this can mean two things, and, and people are divided. I would say it means both. Number one, a path of righteousness is the right way. In other words, God has an opinion. He's not simply standing there watching, going, well, I hope they make the right decision. Good luck. I, I've done everything for them. I, they should be able to figure it out on their own. Hey, we're sheep. <laughs> he comes and he says, come to my word. It will make you wise. Pray for wisdom, as James says, and I want you to go the right way. There is a right path. The second thing, though, paths of righteousness also mean the paths that will make you righteous. God is interested in your sanctification. And what sanctification is, is the process of you becoming less like your sinful self, dead to that, and more and more alive to God. More and more conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. So when we talk about paths of righteousness, what we're talking about also are what path is going to make you more righteous, is going to make you more into the person of Jesus Christ. And you will always love it. Wow, it's going to hurt. It's going to be like sandpaper on a piece of wood. And yes, as the wood is probably, if the wood could talk, it would go, oh, this is painful. Stop. Why are you doing this? Lord, why would you allow this? But in the end, the piece of wood is made to look like Jesus Christ. He's leading you on a path of righteousness. It's right. And on a path that will make you righteous. Not comfortable. Not your best life now. But to make you into more like Jesus Christ. Verse 4, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. How has God been referred to thus far? Prior to this, in the, the first three verses, how has God referred to? He, 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 the Lord, the Lord, the Lord. David here shifts to you. Suddenly we're getting very personal. What changed? Where's he at? Death Valley. The valley of the deepest shadows. Um, and by the way, you cannot have mountains without also having valleys. And in this fallen world, there are times that you will look and say, everything is wonderful. I am uh, still waters and green pastures. And there are times you will go, good grief. This world is not for wimps. Since Adam and Eve, we have lived east of Eden. Every person alive. We are born. This world uh, is shockingly painful. And yet, it's nothing compared to the sinfulness that's inside of my own heart. And so, here we see that as we're passing through this valley, this darkest valley, this valley of the shadow of death, David changes from talking about God to talking to God. And I would encourage you as you're on your own Berean journey, as you're learning more about God, let that transform as David does, your relationship with God. Don't just speak about Him, but let that inform your prayers to Him. So he's clinging more tightly uh, to the shepherd here. And it's always in the darkest times of our lives that we learn true intimacy with the Father. I would love to tell you and, uh, and I would love to experience uh, this nearness with Father during the times uh, of peace, the times of comfort. And that does happen. I can watch a beautiful sunset sometimes and go, Father, thank you. But it's the dark valleys and I predict, uh, perhaps you're like me, I think most of us are like this, where we learn to truly trust the shepherd's providential hand. And it's so hard, and it's so painful. And yet, what's the great promise here? You are with me. There is nothing in this universe better than the presence of God. And he has promised in these darkest valleys to be with us in a special, sustaining way. So the sheeps had to stay close uh, in the dark valleys. Uh, um, 
I don't know if you, uh, the shadows, uh, certainly on the, the sides of the road grow, uh, back in the ancient Near East were where the robbers were, where the lions waited, where the bears were. They were areas of fright. And yet, David says, I'm not going to fear evil. So Christians are to be bold. We are standing on the shoulders of Jesus Christ who has already defeated Satan, has already defeated death according to 1 Corinthians. We are to be bold. We are to be fearless. Now, we're still sheep. We still fall into those things. But we have a Savior who has won the victory for us. We no longer have to be slaves to fear. Uh, And so he promises his presence. He promises that we need not be afraid. Uh, Again, as Solomon said, why? Because I am my beloved's and he is mine. He has bound himself. The shepherd doesn't retire. In fact, um, I think uh, it's in John 5 that Jesus, Jesus promised his disciples, my father, he's always working. He didn't take a nap. He's always working on our behalf. Uh, Very quickly as we wrap up, uh, I would turn to verse 4. He says, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Um, Of course, we see in Scripture the rod uh, is used to what? You can say it. Discipline. Discipline. Uh, That's exactly right. We use the rod to hit people, to whack people. Now, when are we the most comfortable? Well, I'll tell you this, when we're the safest. And so how are the rod and the staff able to comfort us? Because we know that God is fighting for his people. It was a fearsome thing in the Old Testament to attack Israel. Why? Because Yahweh was on their side. God was going to fight for them. You have a God who looks at you and says, I fight for you. You don't have to be afraid. Uh, David said it this way in 1 Samuel 17. He said to Saul, everybody was afraid to fight Goliath. Here comes little David. Your servant used to keep sheep for his father. And when there came a lion or a bear and took a lamb from the flock, I went after him. Okay, so the lion needed to be afraid of me because I'm coming for him. Uh, And if he rose, excuse me, and I struck him and delivered it out of his mouth. And if he rose against me, I caught him by the scruff of his neck. I struck him and killed him. Your servant has struck down both lions and bears. And this uncircumcised Philistine shall be like one of them, for he has defied the armies of the living God. We are not afraid. We do not have to be afraid. Uh, And incidentally, uh, this is a good picture of our elders. This is a good picture of those of you who are elders. And I would ask you, uh, as you look around and you see these men who have been called by God to shepherd the sheep, would you pray for them? They need it. Protecting the sheep is a full-time job. It's not easy. Finally, uh, what does it look like to belong to Christ's sheepfold? This is the shalom. We've talked about the sheep. We've talked about the shepherd. Now we're talking about the shalom. And as I said before, shalom means peace. Uh, The Aramaic word is salam. The English word is Salem, right down the road, Winston-Salem. It's peace. Uh, Jerusalem, uh, the city of God's peace. Uh, He says in verse 5, what's it like to be in Christ's sheepfold? You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil and my cup overflows. We are the people who can rest. We are the people who can Sabbath. Even in the midst of men who would seek us harm, in the midst of a fallen world that hates you. Jesus promised the world will hate you because of him. That means you're going to be misrepresented all the time. There will be straw men built around your opinions and they will say things that you never said and start to speak against you as though you had. Be ready for that because we can have peace. Christ has overcome the world. We don't have a peace as the world gives, but as God gives, a deep soul peace. And so Satan may be roaring around like a lion, but he is a defeated enemy. And even death. Even the final enemy, we we romanticize death now, and I don't understand where this has come from. Uh, In 1 Corinthians 15, Paul says, the last enemy to be destroyed, death is an enemy to be destroyed, is death. Christ defeats even death. And so we have God's peace, God's shalom. 
Uh, and I'd like to very quickly turn uh, Philippians chapter 4, uh, 5 through 7. Paul says this about the great shepherd. The Lord is at hand. That is, the Lord is near. So do not be anxious. Do not be anxious about anything. But in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God and the peace of God, the shalom of God, which surpasses all understanding. It doesn't make sense. It surpasses all understanding. It comes from somewhere outside of us into us, straight from the Father's hand. will guard your hearts, guard your minds in Christ. And what happens then? Goodness and mercy. Verse 6, follow me all the days of my life. And how do we know this is written to believers? They dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Our life with Christ now starts now, but continues throughout all of eternity. We're about to take communion. This is a visible reminder of God's good providence in our lives. We're going to look at things that nourish us physically, and yet we're going to be feeding on Christ spiritually. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you that it divides, it divides us down to the deepest levels. And yet it's also our sword. We're to use it inwardly. We're to use it outwardly. I pray that we would feed on you by faith and be thankful in our hearts. And it's through Christ that I pray this. Amen. Here's how it all began. The upper room is the scene. The speaker is the Lord Jesus, fully aware of uh, what was coming. And Jesus took bread and gave thanks and broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, take and eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup, gave thanks and offered it to them saying, drink from it all of you this is the blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I'll not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. The sacrament to which we come now is a means for the people of God to draw near to God in a particularly intimate and close, uh, special way. God's always with us, but here, he comes into close contact with us. So we invite to the table all of those who are trusting in His Son, the Lord Jesus, for their salvation. This is a sacrament for Christians, but not just for Presbyterian Christians or South Lake Christians. If you're a Christian, a believer, a follower of Christ, and a member in good standing with any evangelical church, then you're welcome uh, to this table. The invitation, which is broad and uh, winsome and real comes nevertheless with a warning attached that we who come clinging to our sin, uh, refusing to renounce our sin, preferring it as it were over the Lord Jesus, then do harm to ourselves. And we're encouraged not to come until things are made right between us and our Savior. And that can be done in a moment when you might find true repentance in your heart, not just a recognition of your sin, but a heart's desire to turn from that sin and to walk in newness of life, in a fullness of righteousness, with the Spirit helping you to honor the Lord Jesus who died that we might know forgiveness of sins. We do not include our youngest children in this sacrament because our understanding is that the Bible requires that a person achieve a certain level of understanding of these things, discerning the body of Christ, as we read in 1 Corinthians. And so until our children have been instructed in the significance of these matters and have been examined by the session, our elders, and admitted to the Lord's Supper, we do not include them. We also warn even Christians, believers, people who have followed Christ in the past who are far from Him today, unless you can make it right in confession and repentance, then you abstain until such circumstances have been remedied. But the invitation, the emphasis is on the breadth, the, the, the reality of the invitation and the open arms of the Savior who bids you come to His table. 
James, I'm going to pick up the hand mic, and we'll continue with that. I mentioned our youngest children, and while they cannot commune here, we would want to offer them a blessing, and so if your parents wanted to have your children come, the pastor would be glad on the behalf of the Lord Jesus to pronounce a blessing over them. The way we've been conducting the Lord's Supper during these months of the COVID restrictions is for people to come and serve themselves. Uh, the, uh, the bread is here, the cup is here. We'd like you to come and maintain the social distance with which you're comfortable, pick up the elements for yourselves and take them back to your seat, and then we'll all commune in the bread, in the cup, uh, together when the time is right. So be leisurely about this, no need to crowd, um, and make yourselves comfortable, as I say, with the uh, distance that you maintain uh, between yourself and uh, others. Now, let's pray and dedicate these gifts to the Lord. Father, we count this as a great gift, a great accommodation to our need to be able to taste something and to see something, uh, to feel something, to smell something, to be put in mind of the reality of your constant presence with us and the special presence that you offer to those who come and commune in faith with you, Lord Jesus. And so we set apart these very common, ordinary elements to this high and extraordinary uh, role that they play in this ritual, this sacrament, this communion, and pray that everyone who eats and drinks here in faith might be made a true partaker of the body and blood of the Lord Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. And so it was that on the night in which he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And he gave it to his followers to eat, just as I now give it to you. And in the same manner, after supper, he took the cup and said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. All of you drink from it. And so, ministering in his name, now I invite you to come, following his command, and eat and drink to the blessing of your soul. And 
Jesus said, this is my body, which is for you. the blood of the covenant poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Has everyone who wishes to be served been served? Let's pray together with a prayer of gratitude, thanksgiving, and renewed commitment. 
Father, as you have drawn near to us by the gift of your Son and the filling of your Spirit and your own promise never to leave us nor forsake us, we feel blessed. And Lord, it's not just a feeling. It is a reality. Because just as your Word accomplishes all that you send it to do, so does this sacrament accomplish all that you have intended for it. As it, Jesus instituted it, and it has been repeated down through the ages. So we pray that we might experience really and truly a newness of life, might be persuaded by these gifts and their tangibleness of the reality of the forgiveness of our very real and tangible sins, and that as you have come into our bodies, the bread, the wine, representing Christ himself, May we revel in the reality that we are in Him, just as He is in us. And may this bring us joy and hope and peace and commitment and renewal of intention to rejoice as we seek day by day, more and more, to live for Christ, dying unto sin and exalting Him as our Master, our King, our Lord, our Savior, all to the glory of His name in the expanse of his glorious kingdom. Amen. Please stand as we sing a song of response to the Lord's sacrifice and blessing to us. transgressions he was crushed for our sins punishment that brought us peace was upon him by his wounds by his wounds we are here he was pierced for our transgressions crushed for our sins punishment that brought us peace was upon him by his wounds by his wounds we are here we are here Thank you again, Joel Jessen, for being here with us today. Pastor Gregory, great pleasure to have you and your family. And may the Lord bless you for having blessed us so richly.
And now, people of God, receive the blessings of God. May the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, equip you with everything good to do His will, working in you that which is pleasing in His sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever. Amen.